Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for being in our midst on a Tuesday night. Amen, 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 amen. While you're standing with me, I want to turn your attention to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read verses 17 through 20. While you're finding that, it's an honor for us to have all of our guests in the house of God tonight. Souls Harbor, why don't you give them a big welcome in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. Everybody say Labor Day weekend. It's going to be a big weekend. We've got a lot of balls rolling for that particular weekend. And um, we've got everything from parent, uh, parent to teachers meeting for Harbor Academy that weekend that pertains to you. You'll want to remember that. Also, we've got a, um, a lot of things being pushed out and prep for apostolic awakening and all of those that have that on your schedule and docket. But also, and the most important thing I think of that weekend, in my estimation at least, is our friends and family day, which is that Sunday. And um, it's, it's a big time, and here's why. Because we've got one service, so we're going to come and we're just going to pour it all out. We're going to worship twice as hard and run twice as fast, pray twice as deep. We've got to get it all in one, in Jesus' name. And then we, um, we're going to go give you just a short break in between after fellowship, um, getting, getting all the kids down from Sunday school. And the ongoings of what comes with that, we've got the Northeast Baptist Gym rented from about 1230 to something. I guess as long as you want to play volleyball. And uh, we got taco trucks coming and so food trucks of, of various sorts. I'm not exactly sure how it's all set up as of yet, but you won't have to do anything but either bring your clothes or swing by the house and change and get get over there. It's going to be a good time. It's inside, outside seating, inside, outside play. Plenty of room and places. If you've never been there, it's a really, really, really neat opportunity for us to be able to do that on a Sunday afternoon, and so it's going to be a good time of fellowship. Um, See, why do we call it Friends and Family Day? We're together every Sunday. Yeah, well, that's the whole point. We want you to bring your and with you, amen, so that they can come experience um, the presence of God here with us and then the fellowship of the family of God afterwards, and so if you, um, if you have guests come, I don't know exactly how it's all set up. There will be um, some meal tickets for guests, and, and we're gonna we're gonna help provide for them um, if they want to eat with us in Jesus' name, and and it's gonna be a good time. So you don't want to miss that, and you don't want to miss the opportunity to um, to use it as an outreach tool. And so if you can get somebody um, who likes food trucks and tacos and volleyball and hanging out and X Y Z, just tell them it all starts at 10 a.m. Amen. And it all starts right here. And uh, I believe God's going to help us. We had four or five receive the Holy Ghost in May during our friends and family Sunday morning. And I believe God's going to do it. But you know how he's going to do it? He's going to do it if you get him here. I mean, we believe they can get the Holy Ghost on YouTube. But we'd like to think that we could also. And so let's plan. You got two weeks. Let's plan to get as many as we can in the doors. Um, so what's the big deal? Well, it's, I, I'm going to tell you. Can I tell you what the big deal is? <laughs> My brother Trost and I were talking over um, Mexican food. Imagine that. This time last week, or maybe it was the next day, I don't know, but and uh, we had, he had heard some discussion of some of the implementation of retention discipleship programs that we're looking to use here and um, engaging in and doing our very best. It's just what we do. We're just doing our best. Amen. It's, uh, we, we are not of the opinion, like my father-in-law says, well, we thought this was the least that we could do, so that's what we did. 
<laughs> Let, let's, let's, let's flip that. Well, I figured this is the best we could do. So, And in the process, he got to kind of joking. He said, man, he said, the most oft-used door in the church is the back door. Bakari said, you can't, and you can't keep it closed. No matter how good you preach, no matter how great they sing, no matter how much God moves, the back door is going to be an off you. And he was joking. He's been an evangelist and a pastor and a missionary and so on and so forth. And, and he said, I've, I, have, I have used a lot of stuff. We've had success with a lot of stuff. But he said, the most success we've ever had in keeping the back door closed. Lord, I was like, he said, is to make your front door larger than your back door. And for those of you who have not been churched for very long, what I'm talking about is the church tends to have a bit of a revolving atmosphere. Folks come in, uh, get the Holy Ghost, God touches them, absolute world-changing things happen, and you're like, my God, where are they at the very next week? Life has a way, and temptation has a way, and, you know, just, just what have you. We're not saying that's bad on any particular individual, but I don't believe it's what God wants to see. I think we can see that in his word. It's sure not what we want to see, and we want to see what God wants to see, and it was a little tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, he's, he's done this a time or two. I don't know a whole lot of people in six months took a church of five and had to buy a building on the seventh month. I don't, I don't know. I just don't know a whole lot of folks like that. And that wasn't in Africa or Papua New Guinea or wherever you may think. That's right here in the south. Came off the missions field, took a church of five. Within four weeks, it was 60. Within six months, it was 160 to 180. Something happened. It just about split in half. And six months later, it was 220. So he, he got, he's got at least a trick up his sleeve. Amen. And in his funny way of saying it, as we learned the drost humor, flows deep in those veins. Um, he said the best way to keep that back door from being overused is to keep the front doors bigger and open. Amen. And so, I believe that God is pouring His Spirit out. And we have seen dozens receive the Holy Ghost and, and we're not yet in our final quarter of the year. I believe we can see more in the last three months than we saw in the first nine. Does anybody believe that? Amen. And a key to that happening is us using every tool that is at our disposal. And so we do. And um, this is one of the many that we use. And uh, we rely. We don't need your money for this one. We don't need your, we don't need anything but for you to bring someone who needs this gospel to this house along with you. Say, well, pastor, I'm not really there yet. I don't think, hey, listen. It don't matter where you are. It don't matter how hungry you are, amen. If you have half a burger left in your hand, aren't you going to give it to somebody when you see that they were as hungry as you were when you began the eating process? So some of us are only halfway where we want to be or maybe less than that, amen. But we can reach for people who are hungry while we're still feeding on the same word that is filling our souls and getting us all to heaven in Jesus' name. With that said, there are invitements. You can take them. They're in English and in Spanish. You can take them, take a pack of each. You can write your name. It's got all the church information right there. Let's get our community. Amen. There's people who can't seem, I can't say the right thing, man. I feel like I stick my big old size 13 right in my mouth every time. Okay, but can you do this? Everybody do this. Put your hand in your pocket. Now close your fist, pull it out, and do this. Boom, you qualify. High five your neighbor. Tell him you qualify for, for daily vitamins. In Jesus' name. Bundled, they're bundled um, cards, church cards. They're sharp, they're easy to read, the information's accessible. Use them, and um, use them as conversation starters. Oh, she's not in here, but, but listen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to encourage somebody. Uh, my wife, myself, and another family was in a tea shop, were in a tea shop uh, this time last week. And we were walking out of the tea shop, 
and they had kind of connected with the person that was in there. They were their age, their gender. Uh, these young ladies had connected with the young ladies that were behind them. And I stopped at the door. I said, hey, go invite them to Friday night. And they were like, oh, oh. deer in headlights. Well, they turned around. They invited them. Ah, and they didn't show Friday night. But I was in that tea shop today. And she said, hey, are you from the church in Calhoun? I was like, wait, what church? <laughs> I said, Souls Harbor? She was like, yeah, Souls Harbor. There was a big group of people in here. She didn't realize that I was in there. There's a big group of people in here the other day, and they invited me to a big revival service Friday night, which wasn't a big revival service, but you kind of get the point. She, she, she knew what she was talking about, and she said, and I was praying this week that somebody would come back in this tea shop because I had forgotten when I told them I wanted to come. I had something else planned, but I can't wait till the next time y'all have a... See, the whole way, things are happening. Don't get discouraged. 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 Do not be weary in your well-doing. In due season, ye shall reap if you faint not. I tell you what, Brother Miguel, it's a better chance of somebody coming here on Sunday and getting the Holy Ghost if we flood every business and, 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 and every restaurant and every door with invitations and fires and tracks and such and so forth. It's a better chance that they're going to reach for that. She had the card saved by the cash register. She was ready to prove she had been witness to and she wanted to take good on that invitation. Let's fill this city up with invitations to the cross. Amen. Invitations to the power and presence of God. Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 through 20. Think not that I am come to deny or destroy. The word is to literally um, disintegrate or to abolish the law or the prophets. I am not come to abolish but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you till heaven and earth pass away not one jot. Everyone say jot. Or one tittle, everybody say tittle. Not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all till all be fulfilled. Therefore, therefore, whosoever shall break one of these least jot tittle commandments and shall teach men to do so by modeling that behavior, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Maybe I should have titled this Nothing But a Tittle. As small as a jot. But whosoever shall do and teach, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise, by no means, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's raise our hands and ask the Lord to touch us in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for your goodness. Your blessing is deep and it is wide and your presence is here and your spirit flows among us and we are eternally appreciative. I thank you. I love you. I lean on you. I count on you. You are our rock, our savior. And we want to be pleasing to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Look at your neighbor and say the Christology of the Word. The Christology of the Word. We began a bit of a shuttle step of the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with the Beatitudes last Sunday the last Sunday morning of June, first Sunday morning of July. I'm not filling time by saying this. My desire was to begin a Tuesday night series following that of the Genesis narrative with Matthew chapter 5 and, and the, the succeeding chapters of the Beatitudes and Sermon on the Mount. And then I... Uh, realized that most of the Tuesdays would be taken up with what we felt in the Holy Ghost as uh, the directors uh, of departmental directors is what I'm referencing there. Uh, felt impressed to move into a season of prayer in the summer 
and thank God for what we experienced in that. In Jesus' name, I miss it right now, and I know we're going to miss that, and we'll be coming to you with a schedule of prayer here in the next few weeks. But I'm making mention of this because it was preached on a Sunday morning. There were many of you who were at work upstairs, and um, as much as I would like to think that you're bored enough to listen to all my sermons, even when you miss them, I'm not quite that wet behind the ears. And so, we are not going to take back off at the beginning. We are already through the Beatitudes, and we are already through the first section of verses of Matthew chapter 5, and I do want to let you know so that you can go on YouTube and look those up, or if you're not a YouTuber, you can ask our wonderful, forever patient, scholarly, tremendous media team who are the kindest people on planet earth, who can overlook even the greatest of heinous crimes against them, like what happened last Sunday morning. They can help you um, get that uh, at whatever way you can take it in, technologically speaking. But Sunday um, morning, June 25th, I preached about I want to be a Christian, the Beatitudes, the delightful attitudes Um, the spiritual posture of those who are part of the kingdom of God and how they flow one from another in that as the Holy Ghost fills us and we become a citizen of the kingdom of God, not the kingdoms of this world. And we, we take our rightful place and posture position in the family of Christ, the second Adam, not just the first Adam. From this flows attitudes, delightful is the actual Greek word, delightful attitudes that flow one from the other. For if you do one, they cascade in a domino-like effect into the next. He gives way from that uh, dynamic to the discourse on salt and light. Amen. Everybody say tasty salt. Everybody say bright light. And it's what you and I, as those who possess and live through the flow of Delightful attitudes are indeed called to be salt in the earth, light of the world. In a dark, decomposing world, we are the church. We are the model, amen. Look at your neighbor and say it's hard to be what you cannot see, amen. So we become not only the light of the world, the lighthouse, the guiding light, we become that thing that is A preservative from the word salt comes the word salary. It's a big deal in the new world. And we are called to be both of those things, to preserve and to light and guide. The statement or quote that I use that I feel so near and dear to this church's heart, one candle, if I've only one candle of life to burn, I'd rather it burn out in a land filled with darkness than go to waste in a land filled with light. Amen? What does that mean? It means that you can be one candle among many in this church, but when you make the decision to go and be a light unto the world, you are utilizing your one life to light a dark, dark decomposing world. As the church, as individuals, we walk into the worlds of demonic forces that are causing corrosion and decomposition of every moral and every ethic and everything that we as humanity were created and intended to be. And we apply the preservative of the Spirit of God that he likened unto salt, and the guiding flame we provide for them to see their way to Calvary's cross. Can anybody say amen? Amen. He moves from the delightful attitudes into the dynamic of salt and light into a conversation that seems to not be in much of an order, but this is the greatest sermon. By the greatest preacher. Uh, there's, 
There's no more prolific way to say that, though it's a bit underwhelming to say it that way. This is the most well-composed, thorough, dynamically and thematically exhaustive sermon that has ever been communicated to mankind. Communicated by a communicator who could communicate so good that he spoke the worlds into existence. Understood fully the word, the origin, and expectation, and simultaneously the humanity wherewith everyone who would hear it would be clothed. Bar none. No exceptions. Case closed. There are no mistakes in this sermon. Ronnie Gidros, who I invited to come preach as soon as he gets the opportunity. Quite a man from quite a Pentecostal lineage. I heard him say one time that, <clears throat> let's see, he's, and of course he's traveled preaching for many years and so, you know, it's, it's coming from his perspective, but he said, Brother Masters, once you've preached a sermon 35 or 40 times, it's ready to preach at a conference. Amen. Now, he lived for 33 years, but I don't think other than in model, he preached this sermon more than one time. But it didn't need 35 to 50 times. What I'm trying to tell you is that what he segues from and what he segues into is not a mistake. It's not a mistake. Amen. And what he swings into helps us to under, understand everything that has come and helps us to understand everything that is coming. Many times throughout the Word of God you hear him say, oh, you can't understand it now, but you will. Okay. It all centers on this, your Christological approach to the Word of God. Theology, ology, study of. Amen. Study of Theos, God. Christology, study of. Ology, study of Christ. Your Christology matters. How you approach Christ makes a big difference in how you approach the Word of God. The real issue being handled here is the issue of biblical authority. And biblical authority is ultimately a question of Christological identity. Now that's a quote from Daniel Aiken's seminary professor named Ross Bush. The issue of biblical authority is ultimately a question of Christological identity. Your approach to and your view of. Now, if you've not experienced a Tuesday night at Souls Harbor, voila, this is us, amen? We're not in a hurry. Don't think this is going to change very much. Well, and it might. Just as soon as you get to thinking it won't, it will. And uh, like one man said, the only certainty is change. But, but I want us to take a long time relationally speaking, relatively speaking, to discuss a little bit, amen? Sunday nights, Sunday mornings even, we take a little time on a lot of stuff, and it's right, and it's in order. But tonight, I want us to take these four verses, focusing on two and then namely one, to really understand something, because there is a gem in here, but we're going to have to mine it out and dust it off and polish it up for it to really look and appear and do what it was intended to do. You can either go to sleep or, Sister Masters, I don't know if Brother Masters was like this, but when I was traveling and the boys were fussy, she'd get me on the phone. My voice was always shot and gravelly. I guess that had something to do with it. And she said, would you please, I'm just going to put you on speakerphone. I just need you to talk. I don't care what you say, just talk. And for whatever reason, my voice would put my boys to sleep. And I have found that they're not the only ones. <laughs> my voice, praise God. Anyway, so. You can either go to sleep or you can 
you can understand that the teaching of the Word of God, we, we establish a lot of high stuff, and we go to high places, and you could describe it lots of different ways, but it's, it's explosive, and boom, we go into this upper atmosphere, and, and you have to understand that there's got to be something at the base that allows us to do that, amen, and so we spend a lot of time Sunday mornings early in deeper class, and and Bible studies, and Bible studies, and, and, and Bible studies, and classes, and Bible studies, and Tuesday nights, trying to create a depth, and a width, and a solidity, and, and a weight, even if you would, too. So, it's going to be that tonight. Don't shout yet. Your approach to, and your view of who Jesus is ultimately influences your view and approach to the entirety of Scripture. The entirety of Scripture. Your theology of the living word, somebody say living word, it, it inexorably impacts, without refute, period, no questions, impacts your theology of the written you, you can't have proper approach to the written Word of God if you don't have proper approach to the living Word of God. And I'm going to prove this from a few different examples here. But, but, but this is what Jesus is dealing with. One of the key takeaways from this set of Scriptures is to understand, and, and I don't know that I've ever asked this question to myself. I don't know that I've ever been asked this question uh, and maybe maybe you have, maybe you got this, and man, you can go fix us a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for when this is over with if you need to. But what does Jesus think about the Bible? You ever asked yourself that question? What does Jesus think about the Word of God? If you could sit down and talk with him and ask him the question, hey, tell me your approach to Scripture. This is what he would say. I don't know about you, but that kind of gets me a little bit giddy on the inside. That's exciting. Verse 17. Do not think that I have come to rip apart, to abolish, to, to destruct, to destroy, to, the word disintegrate is really the best, to, to do something to the word of God such that it loses its integrity, or its integration. The Word of God is thoroughly, fully, completely, perfectly whole and integrated from covenant to covenant with no exemption, no mistakes, no... I mean, the profundity of this is a part of what proves the, the historical reliability of the Word of God itself. The fact that... All the different writers from all the different ages, many of them without any interconnectivity, created this perfectly seamless word. Like, there's only one way for that to happen. I mean, we can't even get to the letter Z when we're playing, what are you going to take to the picnic? Amen? <laughs> we can't go in a youth group circle figuring out. What that one phrase where it started, we, we can't, uh, how, so how did all, well, I'll tell you how this all, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That, that's, that's how it happened. But my theology of the, of the written word of God is directly, profoundly impacted by my theology of the living word of God. I did not come to disintegrate the law or the prophets. This is a reference to the Old Testament. Jesus is living not in what we biblically as a um, liturgical source would view as the intertestamental period, but he's here. Now, the Holy Ghost is not yet given. It's not over, but we're in that spot, and he's referencing Old Testament law and prophets. He says, I've not come to abolish that. I've not come to do away with it. I've not come to break it down. I've not come to ruin its seamlessness. I've not come to disconnect its connectivity. I've not come to do any of that. I've simply come to fulfill the law. 
to fulfill it. Listen, the competition here, it's not, listen, it's not a destroy versus uphold. It's not what he was saying. He wasn't saying, I've not come to destroy it. I've come to uphold it. Like, you, we still need a rock that follows us through the wilderness. No, we know who that rock was. Paul said that rock was Christ. Well, we still need a, no, we know who that is. That mercy seat is Jesus. We don't. I've not come to break down the mercy seat. I've not come to break down that signet of provision. I've come to fulfill that. That's, I, I've not come to destroy it. It's, it's not a destroy versus uphold. It's a destroy versus fulfill conversation. The testamental practices. Uh, listen, the testamental practices that are fulfilled. Leave us still with eternal principles to follow. Okay? Pork's not off the menu because the hoof and the cud doesn't match up. But there's still a practice that comes. There's still an understanding that you've got to get it right on the outside and the inside before you're fit to be pleasing to God. Amen? Ain't nobody in this building plows with an ox or an ass. Y'all plow with John Deere's and Massey Ferguson's. Well, y'all probably don't plow at all, but if we were to, that's how. So it's an Old Testament practice that you don't take a yoke and put one kind of an animal here and an unsuitably different kind of an animal here and plow them together. That was an Old Testament practice. You couldn't do it in practice, but because the practice has been fulfilled in the Old Testament, from the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Just, just listen. He, he didn't destroy the principle. The principle lives on. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. For what fellowship hath light with darkness? Does this make sense? The practices are there. The practices have been fulfilled in many ways. But the patterns of principle are still for us today. He came to fulfill those things. Your approach to who he is has, has profound impact on your approach to what the word of God says. There is one religious convention that a few years ago went through a major deal because they got together and wrote and wanted to vote into their bylaws or what have you a statement concerning the full authority of the Word of God. And there were people that had a problem with that stating, they even created other conventions concerning this, stating that while it is a God-inspired book, it is a book of guidance, not a book of final authority. And they suggested that if this group was going to do that, who BT Dubs was a Trinitarian group, then you're going to, you're going to have to make this a godhead of a quartet, not a trinity. Their words, not mine. It'll have to be the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Bible. And I thought to myself, oh boy, your view of Christ so greatly impacts your view of the Word of God. Your view of who He is so, so direly impacts your view of what He said. Amen? If they could maybe understand that it's not a group of three making this world spin. Then they would begin to understand in the beginning, John 1, was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. So instead of creating an extra slot and further dividing up the Godhead, how about let's reverse and let's get our ology on Christ right. Let's get our view of theos, God. Let's get our theology right. And then all of a sudden, the word makes sense. Amen. 
Amen. To be able to separate the will of God from, from the will of the Son. I said, well, who would ever do that? Oh, well, huh, you'd be surprised. It would sound like this in modern day terminology. God wants everybody to be saved. That's the will of God. It's the will of God that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. However, the son died, and while his death and sacrifice was successful to be effective for all, it only succeeds in saving some. And those are those that he calls the people of God, who have been pre destined to be saved. Because you're, you're going to struggle to unify the will of God and the will of the Son when you don't unify the Son and the Father. Amen. Consequently, to name the man who produced this doctrine, he also had a knack for burning monotheists at the stake. Why? Because... It blows your theology up when your Christology's wrong. It, 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 it blows all the doctrines of the Bible up. <laughs> Explodes everything. Nothing makes sense. Nothing goes together. And you've got to take the indoctrination of man and start weaving things together with explanations and malunderstandings to... to, to because now, everything is disintegrated. Nothing integrates until you get your Christology correct. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In him, all fullness dwelt. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Once you get the Christology right, then you ask questions like, what? What? What do you mean? It's the will of God that nobody dies and, 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 and is in damnation. But the sacrifice, what do you mean the sacrifice? Okay. When the Son is the manifestation of the Father, His will doesn't change. Hey, these are large ticket items, but, but you see, do you see the cascading effect? You see how it... Because it's like taking a rifle or a bow or anything that's got a projectile coming out the end of it. And, it, well, it's just semantics, you know. We don't believe in three guys. It's just, we just, you know, it's, we, you know, it's just, you know. But when you're that far off from the beginning, a mile down the road, Then, like, we're having discussions about salvation where you can't be unsaved if you wanted to. And where did that start? It starts at your Christology. It starts at the fact that you think God is three. It starts at the fact in your separation of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost because how you view the written word is so heavily impacted by how you view the living word of God. Amen? If you don't believe the word was made flesh, then you can't believe that he is his word. So you don't have to stick to his word any more than you felt he stuck to his word. And when you get that demonic feeling, that demonic delusion inside of you, that, well, he came and destroyed and disobeyed and annulled and and, and some of that, oh, then, then you know, I feel like then, yeah, I was reading the book of Romans today, and, and I was like, man, that's something right there I don't think I'll ever preach. Paul writes to the church at Rome. He'd never even been there, but he writes to them, and he says, how dare you say, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sin because when I sin, God's grace makes an appearance, so it must be the will of God for me to get him to make an appearance because that's his plan. So I tell you what, I'll give him a Mercedes Benz to do it in, and I'll sin. 
Like, who would be that uneducated? I mean, that don't make no sense, Brother Masters. But when your Christology's off, you get all the way down the road and all kinds of stuff's off. All kinds of stuff's off. And we can pick and rip and buffet style this whole word because in our spirits, it's not integrated one into the other. Amen. But when we really understand who the word was, not just what the word, when we really understand who the word is, and when it came to a discussion of the word, he said, hey, 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 don't get to thinking that I came to disconnect the word, that I came to destroy the word, that I came to annul the power of, no, no, no. I came to seal it up, fulfill it. I am the word of God. I came to be the word of God, thereby fulfilling the word of God. And I'm going to live on the inside of you. And that's how the Old Testament prophets are going to have the manifestation of their prophecy that I'm going to write my word in your heart because I'm going to fill you not with the inscribing, but the spirit of the word itself. Now, now my Christology. This is not just nuts and bolts, folks. This makes a big difference. This is why when you're teaching Bible studies, you got to be doing spirit stuff while you're doing word stuff. Amen? Because the stuff that's been puked into them, the, the demonic doctrines, say that's a strong phrase. Take that up with Paul. He called it doctrines of devils. He called it doctrines of devils. Get on your search. He called it doctrines of devils. And that stuff is not just some man. They picked that up with a grandparent in a denominal church at six and eight years old. But it's taken root in their heart. And it's, it's impacted decisions that they've made. You don't just deliver to them a, 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 an entrance into the marvelous light. you got to do things in the Holy Ghost that combat. Pray over that Bible study. Pray with them. Lay your hands on them. Let the spirit of the word of God bring head to toe full impact. Amen. Amen. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, Luke chapter 16, verse 17. I know I'm out of order here. I mean, I'm not like decent and orderly out of order. I just meant I'm out of the order. It is easier for heaven. This is how it's said in the Lucan book. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fall or fail, to drop, the word is. For verily I say unto you, Matthew 5, 18, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot nor one tittle. Somebody holler jot. Somebody holler tittle. The jot was the yod in the Hebrew alphabet, the smallest letter. Not the smallest letter. Not the smallest letter of the law and the prophets. I'm going to tell you what Jesus thought about the Word of God. He said, I've come, and in all of its patterns, in all of its precepts, in all of its nuances, in all of its shadows, in all of its intricate details... In, e in every book, all the books that put you to sleep at 9 o'clock when you forgot to read your Bible earlier in the day, not one of the smallest letters drop. And then he used the word tittle, which is not even a letter. It's a, it's just a stroke of the pen. It's the smallest stroke that changes one letter into another letter. You don't know Hebrew and neither do I, so let's do it like this. A C and a G look a lot alike, don't they? One stroke changes them. An O and a Q look a lot alike, don't they? One stroke changes them. Not one jot, not one tittle of the law and prophets will I allow to pass until all is fulfilled. You can take that out of context and mean until heaven and earth pass away. But didn't you just, you, you forgot to see what the therefore was there for. 
you, you, you forgot to read in context. I've come to fulfill it. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not letting one small letter nor one stroke of the quill, not one drop until I fulfill it. How much did Jesus believe in the word? Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. Paul would say it like this to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture. Somebody say all. Somebody look at your neighbors in the eyes and say all. All scripture is given by inspiration breathed all scripture is god breathed all scripture is profitable well no 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 i don't i don't want to hear about traditions i don't know all scripture well but we not hebrews are all scripture well that's all, all scripture well that's a, all scripture is breathed by god and is profitable for doctrine that's not doctrinal, Pastor, or that's holiness. That all scripture is breathed by God and is profitable. That means the ones you don't understand. That means the ones that black and blue your toenails. That means the ones you don't like. That means the ones your mama don't follow. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine. For a proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Woo! Somebody ought to run. I'm telling you, it's good in the house tonight. Every yod, every jot, every tittle, fulfilled by him, is profitable. Not painful, not antagonistic, not ugly, not haughty, profitable. It would profit us if we would take every jot and every tittle as he fulfills it and do it. Praise God. Speaking of which, whosoever therefore shall break one of the least. Now, he's just described the least. I mean, he did it with. Pretty, pretty fine fashion. Whoever breaks the least. And obviously when you break a law, you teach. I never heard it any better. Brother Masters, a couple years ago, you talked about being out with your son and accidentally doing something out of season. And he kind of called your card on it. I can't remember the details, but this church, some of us remember this. Some of us weren't here. But the understanding of the need to apologize because I did something and it modeled for the person watching to do the same thing. This is what the scripture is referencing right here. Shall break one of these and shall teach men so. He, he shall be the least in the kingdom. But whosoever shall do the least of these commandments, and teach them. The same shall be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, Jesus said the scripture points to him. Oh, that, that was here for me. Oh, that, that was here. Yeah, I came to fulfill that. Oh, that little piece. Uh, yep, that points to me. That's all about me. I came to fulfill that. That's why I'm here. That's what, that, yep, this is what it's all about. All that points straight to me, not me. That's what he's saying. This all is about me. The scripture points to me. And he, he believed. What did he feel like about the word? That even the smallest made a difference. And he purported that we should adhere to and teach even the smallest. I've heard pastors say, hey, well, we're not going to worry about teaching that because, you know, it's just. Whoever shall observe. Y'all know this is one of my favorite scriptures. And do. 
the same shall be great. He said, we're to teach even to the smallest. We're to teach and we are to do them. Look at your neighbor and say, we are to teach. Or we are to, we are rather backwards, we are to do them and we are to teach them. We are to do them and we are to teach them. They ought to be obeyed and they ought to be taught. And here is why. Here is why. You, you, you don't get access into the spiritual things. You can't out-spiritualize. These are poor choice of words, but just hear me. You can't out-spiritualize bad doctrine. Well, we're just going to be, we're going to be so high. No, 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 no. And you've been there and you've seen some of them. And you've seen the crashes as much as you've seen anything. I'm going to tell you the churches that I know go the highest also go the deepest and the widest. The churches that see also go. Praise God. The Christology of the word is understanding who he is. So you can understand what's been said. You got to know who he is. And you got to approach his word the same way you approach him. And here's how he approached his word. It's all about me. I'm fulfilling every jot and every tittle of it. Not one littlest grain of it is going to drop until it's fulfilled. And I want you to go observe it and to teach it. I want you to go obey it. And I want you to teach it. And here's why. Because... Your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Stand with me as Brother Zane comes. Your righteousness has to fulfill or exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the righteousness of the Pharisees. Do you understand? I, I need 30 minutes just on that. Scribes. We didn't have it printed like this. This Bible, let me see. Somebody can grab this microphone so I can do math. I think I got this Bible when I was 14 years old. That would be at least eight or nine years. <laughs> so it's a quarter century old, and it, it's perfect. One little tab came off. Brother Damas showed me but how to fix it. But it, it's perfect. The writ is perfect. I mean, it's just as clear as the day. The pages aren't yellowed. The print, the black, the white, every little line, every little dot, it's all perfect. It wasn't like that back in the day. The paper would degrade, the ink would degrade, and the scribes would have to go in and they would have to copy from original to the next. So they, they, they he made no mistakes in this sermon. I mean, it was the best. The scribes knew exactly how to write a jot. And they knew exactly the pressure and sweep it took to include a tittle as they were writing right to left in the Hebrew language. Beautiful illustration. Beautiful illustration. The scribes know the word, but they're having a hard time receiving the living word. And the Pharisees, they, they, they know the word enough to twist it into working for them. But you, you need both sides of this. You got to have every jot and every tittle. But you got to have it on the inside. You got to have it in here. You, you got to have it in here because th think with me. They, they all knew. <gasps> There's a reason Paul said, Pharisee of the Pharisees. Literally, he was saying, I'm the cream of the cream. Cream of the crop. Top, top of the tippy top. Tippy, tippy top of the top. Now, how am I going to exceed that? Oh, this is the word of God talking. This is the word. Written word manifest in human flesh, living. All prophecies, living. And he, watch, for the word of God is quick, alive, Jesus, and powerful, Jesus, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, discerner of the thoughts and intents 
of the heart. That's the written word, but it's prophetic in a reverse aspect. It's prophetic of the living word, Jesus. And here, his words are alive and they are powerful and they are sharp and they're getting down inside. Sharper than any two-edged sword getting down inside to where we can't no longer divide between soul and spirit. And we don't know what soul and spirit looks like, right? but we know what bone and marrow looks like. So I'm going to throw this parallel in for you to get a visible picture, a visual that, that goes with, you see what he's doing? This is the word of God speaking. And the word of God is casting his opinion about himself when he says, you have to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Isaiah 53, but our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade under the leaf. And our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Right. He's focusing on the heart and spirit of the law. And it wouldn't be many days till he would break bread and say, this is my body broken for you. Take eat. Get me on the inside of you so that your righteousness can exceed the righteousness of the Pharisee. Because while they knew me out here, they far from knew me. What did Jesus think about the word? I'll tell you what he thought about the word. He thought it all pointed to him. He thought the smallest letter of it was as important as the greatest letter of it. He thought we ought to obey it and to teach it. And he thought we needed to take it and apply the spirit and the heart of the whole of it to the inside of us. To become, listen to Paul, living epistles known and read of men so that they can see the living word through the word being lived in a day to day basis. This is true Christology of the word of God itself. I feel like we're standing in the presence of a king. God, I'm so thankful for your word. God, I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful for a basic understanding of who you are. I'm so thankful that you delivered it unto us. I'm so thankful for the access to it. I'm so thankful for what it does for me and to me and for my family and to my family. I'm so thankful that I can lean on it, that I can stand on it, that I can trust in it. Oh, praise God. I know it's Tuesday night and it's, it's yet late. They're just finishing in the back. I believe that we would be amiss because the spirit of the word is here. We'd be amiss not to step out of our pews and come to an altar. We're not even going to sing a song, but this angel's going to play like this. But I wonder if you couldn't come and you couldn't worship the word a little bit. You couldn't come express your thankfulness, your thankfulness for the word, to the word and the spirit of the whole process. God, would you anoint me? Anoint this congregation, anoint this people, anoint our community to be hungry for your word, to seek your word, to find your word to obey your word, to model and to teach your word. God, every word is pure. Every word points to you. Every word has a building block of my salvation in it. Every word has a building block of my deliverance in it. Every word has a building block of the anointing that broke my yoke from off 
my back that enslaved me. Oh, how love I thy law. Thy word was found, and I did eat. Thy word is unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Come on, you ought to pray, God, give me a love for your word. Help me to see it for what it is. Help me to read it for what it is. Come on, you can't want him and not want his word. You can't desire to handle him and not handle his word. You can't pray to him without picking up his word. It don't make sense to run and dance without carrying his word in your heart. You can't be in love with him if you're not in love with his word. Come on, come on, the word of God. The Word of God, the Word of God is tried, and it is true, and it is no respecter of persons, and it is forever settled in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Thank you so much for joining us for service today on live stream. If you'd like to see more content from Souls Harbor, you can check our YouTube channel out. And if you'd like to know some details about the various ministries of Souls Harbor, you can see some of that on our website. We're praying for you and believing that God's moving on you and that his hand is going to work a miracle in your life.